Welcome to EfficientML.ai Lecture 9. So today we are going to talk about knowledge distillation. So first, Lab 3 is out, uh, which is about neural architecture search. We carefully designed the Google Colab, uh, provided you with the once for all network, which is already pre-trained, so that you can search an efficient architecture by sampling different subnet networks from this once for all network. Uh, very affordable search cost. You are going to implement the evolutionary search uh, with uh, different constraints to find the model with the best quality, which is pretty fun. And also, in order to improve the quality of our uh, TA's question answering, we created a Piazza uh, to help you answer the questions for the registered students, regi students who are officially registered in this class. Since we don't have the bandwidth to reply, we get overbooked unexpectedly. A large number of audiences, that's very good, certainly welcome. But we only have one teacher and two TAs, limited capacity. So we want to make sure um, we follow your answer your questions very timely, very carefully. So we have this Piazza group for registered students. And some of you also mentioned uh, it's helpful for doing the group project since you want to find the teammates who are also uh, students who are officially registered for this class, a smaller community. So make sure you ask the questions related to the lab, to the project in Piazza. OK, so before jumping into today's lecture, I'm going to uh, show something fun. So we've been working on a project called um, Streaming LLM. So streaming large language models with attention sinks for you to continuously chat with a chatbot, with non-stop chat. We are going to cover about the details in the large language model part of the lecture. But here, I want to show you a demo. It is previously, without streaming LLM, model performance first break after reaching the window size and then out of memory due to the limited size of the uh, memory for the KV cache. But after applying uh, streaming LLM, you can continue to chat, uh, answer questions, chat with the chatbot. An interesting finding actually dates back to three years ago when we worked on this paper called Spaten, Efficient Sparse Attention for, uh, with, uh, with, with Cascade Token Head Pruning. And we observed a very interesting phenomenon. We, at that time, didn't get an idea how to solve it. Like, the first token is super heavily attended to, no matter what token it is. So like here, he's a very famous researcher in the computer architecture area and has published many in the predict papers. But why papers heavily, so heavily attended to the first character? And similarly, uh, for this sentence here, uh, we can prune a lot of tokens, but the first one, we have to keep it, like Du Fu. It's just a person's name, but why do is important, Fu is not. doesn't make sense, right? And three years later, we finally find the idea. This is called a attention sink. We have to dump a lot of the attention scores to, the, to one of the tokens, even if it is a space, nonsense token, or just a slash n, change a new, have a new line. Since the softmax function has to sum, to sum up to one, there must be some places to dump those unnecessary weights. So um, the first one is, the first token is important when you don't have to keep it. All right, we'll jump into our main lecture. Hope that gives you some idea about the latest research and some of the fun stuff you can potentially work on in the um, open-ended course project. So the challenge here is that we want to um, deploy deep neural nets even if we have limited hardware resources, not only on the cloud, but also on the edge. Even on the cloud, we want to use low power, green AI, save the power, save the planet. Right? But the computation capability difference is huge from several hundreds of TOPS per second. This is, is a bit outdated. Be several hundred TOPS per second versus median flops per second. 
from tens of gigabytes to only a few hundred kilobytes. Um, from ResNet, VIT, MCUNet, MobileNet V2, Tiny. So neural network has to be small to fit these edge devices. But we know how to train large model, but how do we train tiny model? Can we get the help from this large model as a teacher? Teacher, student, large model, small model. Okay. The tiny model are hard to train. Uh, they tend to underfit on large data sets. Like less than 50, um, this is the top five accuracy versus the top one accuracy on ImageNet. Top one accuracy can easily reach beyond 76%. Uh, well, for those mobile nav V2 tiny, um, the top five is only 52%. Top one is lower than uh, 48%. So how can we help the training of this tiny model with the supervision of this larger model? So that's what distillation is about. So this is the illustration of knowledge distillation where we have a teacher network, we have a student network. Given the input, both of them are going to get a logit. And given the logit, we can get the classification loss. That's what we normally do. And here we want to compare the logits from the teacher model and the student model. And how do we supervise that? We want to make sure the student's logics can mimic the teacher's logics to get extra supervision beyond this classification loss. So let's see an example. Given this image, a cat, uh, we pass it through a teacher network. Assume this is a two-class classification, cat versus dog. And the, the larger model says the logic is 5 and 1 after the last layer. And we pass it through the soft max. And we get the probabilities. So this is the logic. This is the probability. And how was that calculated? We are pretty confident here. We have 98.2% 90, uh, probability this is a cat. And it's calculated by EXP5 divided by EXP5 plus EXP1. If this is 5 and 1, that's basically what the softmax is doing. And similarly, we have the probability for the other class, for the dog. If we see the smaller model, the prediction is less confident. The logic is 3 and 2 rather than 5 and 1. And the probability is also smoother, not as confident. Like 90, 98%, here we are only 73%. Okay, so the student model is less confident. So what we want to do here is to boost the probability of the student to mimic um, that of the teacher. Okay? So here um, we can also apply um, a new concept called the temperature okay, to um, smooth um, this probability. Like here, uh, the temperature, if temperature is 1, then we divide 5 and 1 by 1. Otherwise, if the temperature is 10, uh, each term in the softmax, we divided that by the temperature. So the general uh, principle of model distillation is uh, try to match the prediction from uh, the logics from the teacher versus the student model. Okay? Try to match the probability given by uh, the exponent of e, zi divided by t, t is the temperature, versus the sum of all the classes, where c is the number of uh, c is the number of classes, and t is the temperature, which is usually set to one. And the goal of the distillation is to align the class probability distribution from teacher and student networks. So let's see, what, to, what do we match? Okay. There are several different choices. We can match the output logics, the intermediate weights, the intermediate features, the gradients, sparsity pattern, relational information. A lot of different places. We can match the teacher and also the student. 
first of uh, first one, the simplest one, most wide, widely used one, is the logit. Okay, like using the cat and dog example, uh, we have two classes. The last layer's output is either uh, one is five, one is one. Then we directly um, try to match uh, match that. We can use different uh, losses. We can use the cross entropy loss. We can also use the L2 loss, different choices to match the teacher's logic and student's logic. We can also try to match those intermediate weights, teacher's weight, student's weight. And we can uh, try to make sure they are the same. But what is the catch here? Can we directly calculate the L2 norm, or L2 distance between the teacher's weight and the student's weight? Right, exactly. The student network is smaller. That's all the purpose of making it smaller, right? But how can we match large weight tensor with a smaller weight tensor? You can add a one by one convolution or add a fully connect layer to project it. So here, this is a teacher network. This is a student network. Teacher is wider than the student, right? So for the student network, you can pass it through a fully connected layer. Um, to project the dimension uh, to match the teacher's dimension. And you can learn uh, this projector, this blue part, um, end to end. So other than the cross entropy distillation, we can add the IO2 loss between teacher's weight and also student weight. Now, of course, the linear transformation is needed to match um, the dimensionalities between the teacher and the student. So that part, that blue part, is the linear transformation. For example, um, if the teacher's channel is um, 512, student's channel is 256, what is the dimension of that projector from student to teacher? It's 256 by 512 okay, to match the number of channels. That is a simple FC layer used to align the shapes of teacher and student's weight tensor. We can also match the intermediate features, not just the weight, but also the intermediate feature. Not only the last output, this is the last output feature, the last feature map, and this is the intermediate feature map. We can apply the knowledge distillation KD, KD loss, to match the intermediate feature maps. And also the gradients. Okay, we can also try to match the gradient. Um, so here is a plot of intermediate attention maps. Okay, we are back propagating the loss uh, to the future map. And there are so many channels, right? We can either sum up the channel or sum up the square of the channel, right? And see um, where is uh, the gradient. We, if this part is larger, then it means if these pixels change a little bit, it will, be, it will drastically impact the output. The output will change a lot. So that's the meaning of the uh, attention map and gradient. It indicates where is uh, the neural network think that this is important, like thinks this part is important, which makes sense for this fox. So the intuition is that if the gradient is large, Small perturbation at that pixel will significantly input the output. And then as a result, the network is putting more attention to position ij. And assume if you have a teacher model and a student model, they should have similar attention map in this case. And we try to match that part. And certainly, um, we can compare different model architectures. NIN, which has only 62% uh, accuracy, networking network, versus ResN34, ResN101, they have much higher, 10% higher accuracy, 73, 77. Um, although they are uh, different accuracy, but their attention map is similar compared with this poor network, the attention map is drastically, it's quite different. Right? But these high-performing models, their attention map are very similar. No matter what way to use 
uh, as a reduction function since you have to do the reduction across multiple channels. You can have 64 channels, but now you want to have only map one map, then you need different methods to reduce them. You can sum different channels, sum the square, sum the to the power of 4, max, sum, etc. All kinds of functions. You can try to match uh, different um, um, reduction approaches. So this is matching the intermediate um, attention maps. Calculate the gradient with respect to the feature map in layer 1 and in layer 2 and try to match this part. What is the dimension of the gradient? It's the same as the weight, right? And since the weight, they might have different dimensions, the, the gradient also have, may have different dimensions. And we can use a linear projection, the FC layer, uh, to project it to make sure you can directly calculate the R2 distance. Another interesting part, we can also match the sparsity pattern. So sometimes after the ReLU function, a neuron is activated if the value is greater than zero. Otherwise, it will be zero. We use this to indicate uh, the ReLU function. So we try to match the teacher and student's sparsity pattern. If for the teacher, if this is one, for the student, this should also be non-zero, uh, greater than zero. Otherwise, if the teacher is zero, the student should also be zero. Can we do this linear projection? We have actually we're just defined the frame of our weight system. Is that a correct way to describe it? So it's just the weight of the smaller model with the combination of yes, yes, a linear combination of the bigger model. That's what linear projection is doing. It's mm. approximating multiple weights. With, yeah, one or fewer weights. It's so important how that projection is trained. That projection is trained end to end, trained together. And sometimes there are some tricks for doing the projection. For example, you want to apply some clipping, etc. There are some tricks in the projector. Finally, we can also match the relational information. So what is relational information? So far, we just talked about trying to match a single point, like first module, second module, we try to match the teacher, teacher and student's module, right? But here, what it does is try to match the relationship before and after the, neural, uh, the input pass through this module. So here, and here, they are from the same stage, therefore they have the same uh, resolution. The channel might differ. This might be like uh, 224 by 224, 64 channels, uh, sorry, three channels. And here might be 128, uh, 112, 112 by 64 channels, right? And here is the same for the, uh, for the teacher. So here we can compare the difference. So we do an inner product between um, the, here and here. Uh, I made a, a typo here. So it should be the same resolution. Therefore, you can uh, assume they have different channel number, for example, but same resolution number. For example, both of them are 112 by 112, but here might be 64 channel. Here might be 256 channel. Okay. Therefore, you can get a, a 64 by 112 um, a, a, a tensor by doing the inner product between the tensor here and tensor here. Let me write it here. For example, um, in the input, you have 112 by 112 by 64. That's the input of this block. And since they're of the same stage, the resolution is the same. So this is the output of that stage. And you can cancel uh, in the um, xy dimension. So do a reduction in the xy dimension, do matrix multiplication. So what you get is a tensor of 64 by 128. Okay. 
due to the reduction since they are of the same stage, same resolution, so we can get this um, matrix. And similarly, for the teacher, you can also get such a matrix, and you can try to uh, match this 64 by 128 matrix. So this is not only looking at one uh, feature map, but you are looking at the relationship of two feature maps. Another interesting scenario is we can also try to match the relation between different samples. Like here, uh, we have different inputs. Okay? And for the teacher and student, teacher and student, it has T1 for teacher 1, student 1. Um, this is for the second, uh, second image, uh, teacher 2, student 2, third image, teacher 3, student 3. Previously, we are trying to match uh, teacher 1 with student 1, teacher 2 with student 2, try to minimize uh, this pairwise distance. But we, we have another, we can define another similarity uh, between the relationship between S, S1 to 3 and teacher 1 to 3. They may be just shifted a little bit, but they both share, uh, form very similar uh, relationships with each other. So this is the difference between conventional knowledge distillation and relational knowledge distillation. I try to look at the relations between intermediate features among multiple inputs. Here we can take a closer look. Um, this is individual previous uh, conventional knowledge distillation. I try to match the teachers and students' uh, feature map among different inputs, different examples. We have n examples here. Uh, but now we also have n example, uh, n feature maps for the teacher and also n examples for the student. But here we try to define um, the, uh, the, the feature of all these n students to be the distance between um, the student, um, the first input and second input, and also the first and third, and also the first and the last. So we are trying to find the diff between the features of different inputs. And we use that as a feature of the teacher and also of the student. And we try to uh, match uh, this feature, this relational uh, feature. So this is calculating the diff between the first input and second input, second input and third input. And trying to, find, uh, trying to uh, match this relational difference rather than directly matching uh, the, the green and the blue. Okay, so we talk about what to match. And so far, what we discussed is all about one teacher and one student. But what do we need? We only need a small student model. But in order to train a small student model, we first have to train a large, large model. That is obviously a overhead. Can we get rid of all that overhead and just train one model? We cannot distinguish which is teacher, which is student. And do the self and online distillation. So we'll talk about self distillation without a teacher, is, or you are both a teacher and a student, you just teach yourself. Online distillation and also combining them together. And let's see uh, how that works. Like previously, we need a large and fix the teacher model. That one is never updated. Well, we are just updating, updating this small student model. So what is the disadvantage of this fixed and large teachers? And does it have to be the case that we need a fixed large model during knowledge distillation? Can we open the box by either making the teacher to improve, or completely get rid of the teacher. That's what we are trying to, trying to solve. So I'm going to introduce this self distillation with born again neural network. 
So in step zero, we have the model initialized from scratch. And given the input, we have a label. We use the label to train the, train the model, right? We don't train it all the way to converge. But the second step is we try to feed it with an input to the, to the model. And then we get a, a first a generation of student. It's T for teacher, S for student. And the student takes the feedback, the supervision, not only from the output label, but also from the previous generation, the output of the previous generation, using its father as the supervisor of it itself. And the third, the third part, uh, we can repeat this process, right? Like the, the grandparent is supervising uh, the parent. The parent is supervising the kid. You can repeat this across many generations. So you only have one model, but it has this kind of iterative training stages and using both the classification objective and also the distillation objective in the subsequent stages, where the network architecture just have one architecture. Um, and the accuracy are keep increasing, keep increasing. And to boost the final performance, since they're of the same architecture, we can directly ensemble them together. And we can have different stages, the result, the architecture from different stage, merge them together to, to ensemble them. And you have no runtime overhead, since you can directly add those weights. You can also have a weighted average, since um, the later one, later stage one, may have a higher quality than the earlier uh, models. So that's the self-distillation. There's also the online distillation. Um, so what it's saying is that we have, the teacher doesn't have to be larger than the student, or the student has to be smaller than the teacher. They can be of the same size. So they are learned together, and we call it deep mutual learning. Previously, the teacher learns first. You first train a pretty big model. And then you fix that model to train the smaller student model. But in this case, both the teacher and student, you cannot distinguish which is teacher, which is student, because both, they are both initialized from scratch and start the training all together. This is more like your buddy or classmate or deskmate sitting next to you, learning from each other, and also learning from the um, classification of the final labels. So that's why here, the loss for the teacher and the student both have two terms. One term is the normal um, cross entropy loss. Given the input, this is student's prediction, this is teacher's prediction. Y is the label, that's the normal classifications cross entropy loss. And also the chaos divergence between the student's prediction and teacher's prediction. Similarly, for the, for the teacher, teacher's uh, prediction and the student's prediction, you find the chaos divergence. You can do that not only on the final output, but also the intermediate feature maps uh, covered in the section in where to match. So here it's not necessarily to pre-train the teacher and the student. They can both get initialized from scratch. And we can allow the teacher to be the same architecture, same size, same capacity as the student. What's the Uh, you don't want a big model, right? All we want is a small model and try to add some extra supervision so that uh, we can do better than training this small model 
from scratch. So now you get some extra supervision not only from this cross uh, entropy loss, since these two models might be initialized, although they are both randomly initialized, one may have a better initialization, the other may have a worse initialization, and such randomness matters um, when you come to the second term, adding the KL divergence, uh, so that it can get some extra supervision and a little bit larger capacity. And also prevent it from getting a bad initialization, since now you have two models and two initializations. So here we can see um, uh, different data sets, you know, CIFAR 10, CIFAR 100. Uh, this is NET1 and NET2. Actually, uh, they can be of the same, uh, same architecture or different architecture or mobile net versus ResNet. Uh, so if we train them independently, it's 90, 93, 92, but if we use this kind of deep mutual learning, the accuracy is actually higher compared with uh, these two models, uh, these models training independently. And this is the difference of uh, the improvement. And we see at least on CFR 10 and CFR 100, the difference is all positive, meaning that such deep mutual learning is better than this NET1 and NET2 trained independently. I wish the author has uh, provided more ablation study on ImageNet so that we can make uh, this conclusion more solid on larger data set. But at least at this point, we saw for both scenario where the two networks are the same versus uh, these two networks are different um, and both helps uh, to use this deep mutual learning compared with independent training. And finally, uh, we can combine them together to combine this kind of online isolation and also the self isolation. Here, this paper is called Be Your Own Teacher Deep Supervision Fast Distillation. So here it has several loss functions. So the most straightforward one is from this output label, okay, supervision uh, from the labels. Also, it has a supervision from the distillation. Uh, for example, this neural network has three, uh, four blocks and three uh, outputs. Certainly, the deeper you go, the higher the quality. So. Um, if you can only run the first block and then uh, insert a classification layer, just like in um, uh, Google Net, where you have the early exit, and you can calculate the softmax to get a prediction only after you pass through the first residual block. We can imagine the accuracy is the lowest because you just pass through the first block, but acceleration is pretty good since you don't have to run the remaining modules. Computation, the workload is much smaller, so the acceleration is better. Uh, well, if you go deeper, the accuracy gets better, while the acceleration um, gets less significant. Question here? The first day of class, you mentioned this example of you using a lot of these alignment models algorithms. And as we're going through these lectures, is was this also something done with RML or do you have case by case basis? Uh, so this how to supervise the training. It can be auto architecture design or the manual architecture design. So teacher and student, this methodology doesn't care if the teacher's architecture or the student's architecture is manually designed or automated, automatically designed. But once, once you have an architecture, this is all about how to improve the accuracy of that architecture. Say you use once for network, automated approach, you find a good architecture. 
but can I better uh, improve, further improve the accuracy of that one using um, the teacher student uh, teacher student this kind of supervision. So the student model can be either manually architected or automatically architected. Architecture side though is this process is pretty feasible. Certainly, because the block, uh, you can do it in an autonomous way. Because here, within this block, like we mentioned, we can figure out what is the channel number, how many stages we have, that part. But here, the novelty is these lines, where to insert the loss? Where do we insert the loss? Previously, we only insert the loss in the very end. But now, we insert the loss by using the later stages feature map to also supervise these earlier feature maps. No matter, this is orthogonal to the architecture, but this is about how do we supervise, how do we train this model. So if we uh, go through the four techniques we visited so far, right, pruning, quantization, they work on a pre-trained model. You prune it, you quantize it. Neural architecture search can invent new model architectures that is small and compact with, uh, and compact to start with. And also distillation, teacher-student model, teacher-student framework can facilitate the training for all above the scenarios. For example, a natural way is to use a dense network as the teacher and to prune the network as the student so that you can improve the quality, the accuracy of the student model with, uh, of the pruned model with the original dense model. Or you can use this distillation to fine tune a quantized model, right? The full precision model being the, uh, the teacher, uh, the low precision model being the student, right? You can also apply this distillation to neural architecture search. You can um, use design a very small architecture, and then while you are training that, you use this distillation approach with the help of a teacher. So that's why we put distillation after pruning, quantization, and also the neural architecture search. And this is a orthogonal. You can apply this distillation to all these kind of three techniques. So here we can see, we can, since we can exit early, let's see for different networks from ResNet, VGG, ResNext, wider ResNext, et cetera. What is the, um, how deep should we go? So here we have uh, four stages, right? We have four stages. For uh, ResNet 50, uh, we have to go to classifier four, stage four, we have to finish everything. But for VGG19, only after two classifier stages, we can match uh, the accuracy or even better accuracy compared with the baseline. Or uh, ResNet 152, finishing three stages uh, can match or even better accuracy than uh, the baseline model. Okay? So the earlier, um, the better. Like this one, um, after classifier two, it already matches the accuracy as the baseline. So it doesn't have to go through anything deeper. You, you can certainly go to deeper and even ensemble the prediction across different stages together. And you can see you can achieve even better accuracy compared with uh, just running the model, the baseline model. So certainly this adds some complication to use later stage feature map to supervise the earlier stage and use a later stage prediction to supervise er earlier stage prediction. That's why you get uh, different wires here. Uh, we can see uh, accuracy-wise, um, this Cypher 100 shows quite consistent performance improvement over the baseline. And the predictions from these intermediate classifiers, intermediate classifiers sometimes even outperform uh, the baseline. All right, so that's all for the self and online distillation. Let's 
take a break and then talk about different tasks. All right, welcome back. Let's continue our discussion about knowledge distillation, not only for classification tasks, but also for diverse tasks. The knowledge distillation, for example, for object detection tasks. So again, we have teacher and also student, but here we slightly we have slightly more stuff to predict. You know, pre uh, predicting the object detection, we need to predict the bounding box, right? So the face, this is a face, which need a regression. Uh, the bounding box regression. And also for each bounding box, we need to classify what is the class in each, uh, in each bounding box. So there are two problems. There are a lot of foreground and background. Right? So most of the case, uh, this is the background. So we need to balance um, the foreground and also the background. And secondly, the bounding box is a regression problem. It can be anywhere. It's not a classification problem. How do we deal with that? Something simple is um, the intermediate features. We still can we can still try to match uh, those features from the teacher and the student by using a one by one convolution to match the dimension to match the shape. But here, uh, which is the uh, classification, the bounding box, what is the class for that bounding box? Here we use a weighted cross entropy loss. There is a WC over there. Why we need that? Because we want to use different weight for the foreground and also background classes. Maybe the foreground is more important, background is less important uh, to handle this class imbalance problem since there might be a lot of rivers or trees, but very few cats and dogs, we want to make sure uh, that it's balanced. And also here, uh, we want to exploit the teacher's prediction until the student is a little bit higher by M, higher accuracy compared with the teacher. So we allow the student to surpass the teacher, but only by a certain margin. And after that, we stop. After that, the loss becomes zero, which means we are no longer learning from the teacher. Otherwise, um, if the teacher is already weaker than the student, there's no sense to learn from it. Another issue is how do we convert this regression problem um, into a classification problem? When we are doing detection, we want to have the bounding box for the object, which include four real numbers, x1, y1, and also x2, v2, x, y, x2, v, y2. We can turn it into a classification problem by discretize both the x and y dimension. So here we divide the y-axis into six bins, and also the x-axis into six bins. And we can, we can see which bin uh, the target is located at, and use uh, that as a one over six classification problem, so that we can use our um, initial methods to calculate the distillation loss between the two probability probability distributions among that classification problem by the teacher and the student. So that's for distillation. Another important vision application is the segmentation. Like from the ICCV, it's happening this week. Uh, best paper honorable mention is the segment anything model. Right? So you want to segment, give a pixel-wise prediction, like this is the cloth, this is the whiteboard, this is the blackboard, to segment all the pixels. And how do we distill on top of it? Again, we, tr we can try to match um, the pairwise, have the pairwise loss for the feature map between the teacher and student. Okay, this is the input, this is the uh, intermediate feature maps. 
and we have the pixel labeling here, um, we can also have a new thing, which is a discriminator network, try to provide adversarial loss. So here is a um, score map for the teacher and score map for the student. We try to use the GAN approach to train a discriminator network to make sure that the student is performing so well, so close to the teacher, so that it can try to fool this discriminator. Uh, it cannot tell whether the uh, segmentation map, if it is provided by the teacher or provided by the student. We try to make the student so strong to cheat the discriminator and try to train the discriminator to be very strongly to tell whether it's from the teacher or it's from the student. And they improve joint play so that in the, in the end, um, the teacher and student both uh, the student and also the discriminator both get pretty strong. And also knowledge this distillation for GANs. This is from my student's work called GAN compression. So for GAN, uh, we have this GAN loss. Just like we mentioned, the um, generator try to fool the discriminator and the discriminator try to distinguish between if it is real or fake. So that's the a regular GAN loss, C GAN for conditional, uh, conditional GAN. Uh, we have a normal distillation loss like before for the teacher, for the student, different layers. We use the one by one convolution try to do the projection to match the dimension for the intermediate feature map. And here we also have a reconstruction loss uh, for the paired conditional GAN. We can use the ground truth to supervise uh, this generated image. For example, turning a horse into a zebra, a horse into a zebra. And this is the ground truth of the zebra. And for the unpaired conditional GAN, um, we try to use the image generated by the teacher to, to make it match the image generated by the student. And all together, the loss has this kind of three terms, the regular conditional GAN loss, the reconstruction loss, and also this distillation loss. That is the method we use combined with uh, this once for all approach. Actually, um, that's another example showing we can combine neural architecture search with distillation because when we are training, we have a candidate generator pool. We can select the full channel or partial channel, similar as the once for approach. It's elastic. You can uh, choose different part, a sub-network rather than the full network. And finally, we can accelerate this like horse to zebra from uh, 56 giga ops to only 3 giga ops, 16 times reduction. Um, and also the frames per second improved from 12 frames per second to 40 frames per second. And the FID, which is a quality, is even better, even lower. Here's another example. Uh, before scan compression, every edit, the output is very slow. Like we can remove the logo of this shoe. This is called edges to shoes. So you, you draw the edge. It comes with a shoe. We want to draw another logo, but the frame rate is pretty low 1.6 frames per second running on a mobile device. That's a nano GPU. We tried many times to make, a, make it into a Nike shoe, change the logo, but it's very slow. Can we make it faster? Now we see on the right hand side the frame rate increased to almost four frames per second. So we can erase and do new stuff relatively more quickly. And as you as you do the logo on the left, continue give you the output on the right. 
and looks better, faster, both uh, interactive photo editing on the mobile. We can also use knowledge distillation for natural language processing tasks to transfer the attention map. So this is the um, transformer architecture we discussed has multi-head attention followed by the FFN layer, feed forward layer, which is basically FC layers. And then we have QKV projection and also output projection. Uh, we have the normalization layer. Uh, in this figure, it's showing its post norm, but sometimes in recent large language models, people are doing pre norm. We have a normalization before uh, this multi head attention. But here, what we are trying to match is the attention map. What is the attention map? Um, so, this is the um, feature, the attention, attention map. And this is a student uh, with attention transfer versus a student without attention transfer. With attention transfer, we can see uh, the teacher and student's attention map becomes much more similar than without this kind of transfer. Like here and here versus here, we can tell that this is getting closer. And it's again trying to match the relationship between different tokens, try to match this attention map. And also, we can map the feature map. I try to match the feature map. So, no matter what kind of architecture, what, of, what kind of task it is, the key is try to find what to match. And finally, let's talk about network augmentation. We have heard of data augmentation. What is network augmentation? So, the key idea is. The model is just so small. How can we augment the capacity without having to increase the runtime at inference at inference time? So to learn about network augmentation, let's first see data augmentation. So data augmentation deal with overfeeding, but network augmentation deal with underfeeding. So if the model is pretty big, but but we don't have enough data, we can do a data augmentation. Uh, try to cut out a certain region, or mix up cat and dog, or auto-augment to change the color, uh, to do rotation to the, to do the crop, and do an automatic combination of them. And drop out is another concept right? to prevent uh, overfeeding. At training time, we can randomly remove different activations, but at the inference time, they all come back. And you still run the full model at the inference time. Only tr during training time, you randomly remove some of the neurons. There's also a spatial dropout. We can remove the whole channel or drop block to remove uh, a more coarsely a few blocks. So all these techniques no matter if it's dropout or data augmentation, can improve the large neural net's performance and prevent overfeeding. Like this is Resident 50 with 4 gigamax. The original accuracy is about 76, a little bit more than 76, alpine accuracy on ImageNet. But by applying mix-up, auto-augment, drop block, the accuracy can be boosted to 78, more than 78. Unfortunately, these methods hurt tiny models' performance. Like this is mobile v 2 tiny, which has only 23 million max. A few orders of magnitude difference from this ResNet 50 with respect to um, the computation. The baseline model is more than 52%. It's pretty low, but applying these techniques, mix up, auto augment, drop block, the accuracy is even lower less than 50. So that's the issue where we don't have a good approach to train these tiny nets. And conventional data augmentation drop out, these approaches actually doesn't work for tiny neural network training, but even hurt tiny neural network training because they don't have enough capacity. So how do we uh, solve the issue 
and improve the capacity of tiny models. We can augment it with the help of neighbors. We have talked about self distillation and joint learning. You want to learn, you want to have a body to learn together with yourself. So here, what we do here is get some, we want some extra supervision during the training. So we build an augmented model, and the target uh, tiny model is a subset, just like the once for all network. They share the weight. These red weights are exactly the same as the red weight in the student. And it also has some actual weight that is in black that only belong uh, to the augmented model. So given the input output, we not only pass the forward and backward to get the, the loss of the base, uh, base model, but also from uh, the gradient from this augmented model. The augmented model share the weights with the base tiny model with some actual W augment, some augmented model weights. Since they share the weight, all the gradient will also flow um, to the original model to update those red shared weights. And at each step, we can sample different augmented model, large and small, just like what we did in the once for all network. And in this way, we can get some actual supervision by sampling different uh, augmented models. But they all have this core, which is the, the tiny model in the middle. So for a tiny neural network, the network augmentation can improve both the training accuracy and also the validation accuracy. This is more than a V2 tiny improved accuracy by 1.3, 1.6%. However, as we expected, it only improved the training accuracy of a large model, but didn't improve the training accuracy, uh, the validation accuracy of a large model because it's preventing the underfitting issue. And the large model already have enough capacity, which doesn't suffer from this issue. So we can actually use natural augmentation together with knowledge distillation. This is the baseline of the ME2, knowledge distillation, natural augmentation, knowledge distillation plus natural augmentation. And consistently, give good results across more than 2 tiny, more than 2 v3, and proxies NAS. And compared with uh, knowledge distillation, and also just training for a few longer epochs, since we are afraid of underfitting, how about we just train longer? Actually, we find the train longer doesn't help, sometimes even have a negative effect. So this is a transferring task, not only comparing the image net accuracy, but also show the transfer learning um, capability. And this is the improvement over the baseline. And also on object detection uh, for the same number of computation max, we can improve the accuracy quite consistently. Uh, this is on mobile V2 0.35, uh, one is on Pascal VOC, one is on Coco dataset. So for the same uh, accuracy, you can reduce the computing. All right, so in this lecture, we introduce knowledge distillation to use a teacher model to help the design training of a small uh, student model. We talk about how where to match. You can try to match the weight, the activation, the gradient, the sparsity pattern, the output, the intermediate feature maps. And also talk about self distillation where you not necessarily have a teacher, but you can just, help, uh, just distill yourself during training for different tasks, detection task, segmentation task, NLP task, and more. And finally use network augmentation to prevent underfeeding for small models. And in the next lecture, we'll introduce um, very small network family called MCUNet, uh, which is applying what we uh, the lessons we have learned so far uh, to design uh, to have algorithm system co-design.
for tiny ML, which can be deployed on microcontrollers. That's all for the today's lecture. We will see you next week. And for those who haven't signed on Piazza, it's good timing to uh, log into Piazza. And